Dredef, Healthcare Stories. Michael Logg is being interviewed in his home in Princeton Junction, New Jersey. My name is Michael Ogg. I live here in Princeton Junction, New Jersey. And I have multiple sclerosis, primary progressive multiple sclerosis, which is, it's really the minority variant of multiple sclerosis. Roughly 10% of all MS cases are, are progressive. So it's, in a way, it's a little bit unusual. Um, and many, even many health professionals, professionals aren't as familiar with, with um, progressive as they are with the more common relapsing remitting. Um, I, as you can see, a wheelchair user. I've got absolutely no use of, of either legs. I've got no use of my left arm. I've got diminishing use of my right arm. I'm mostly lacking any real dexterity now. You can see I can't even really open my hands. To a large extent, the physical disability, um, or disabilities, plural, um, can be adapted for with technology. And, and today, more and more, there's more and more technology. Um, so I feel fortunate that I can participate in a very full way um, in, in society and be out and about and feel every bit, bit as much a participating member of the community as anybody else. So this particular um, set of issues started um, very early in January 2010. Um, and it actually all started, um, unfortunately, with a completely preventable medical error where I was being assessed for wheelchair seating um, and I was working with uh, an occupational therapist. Um, and unfortunately, it was one of those circumstances where she thought that I would do well or do better with a different seat cushion. The seat cushion was changed. One of the things that really should always be done with seat cushions is do what's called a pressure map. Um, a pressure map, if you think of it as a, like a meteorological map that, that, that has a geographical map showing the high and low pressure in the atmosphere, well, it's the same thing. It's, uh, um, it's something that goes on the wheelchair cushion and has got a grid of um, cells, roughly half an inch square, and it just literally reads out the pressure in each one of those. And so you can see which are the high pressure and which are the low pressure areas. This is a very basic diagnostic tool for wheelchair seating. Um, she didn't do that. And worse, changed my cushion, said, well, let's see how this works. And about two hours later, she was on, on the plane on her way to Florida for a week's vacation. And later that evening, it was clear that it was not as comfortable as, as the previous cushion. And within a matter of a couple of days, um, it was clear that I already had some sores. So pressure sores, there's a scale of those going from one, to, one through four. One is the mildest of just um, redness but not skin breakdown. Um, level two is where there's actually skin breakdown. And stage two pressure sores really is the critical point because Recovery, full recovery from a stage two is completely possible in a relatively short amount of time with the appropriate care. But if it goes on from stage two, it can very, very rapidly go to a stage three, which is where there's um, erosion of the um, underlying flesh, to a stage four, where the flesh literally right down to the bone uh, becomes damaged or eroded. And unfortunately, the progression from stage two to stage four um, pressure sore can be in a matter of days. And this is something that the medical community should have been completely on top of. And I started seeing doctors, um, as I say, back in January of 2010 um, with stage two pressure ulcers. And the remedies were very simple. Um, essentially, what you have to do is just take the pressure off, off your rear end. Um, that's all there is to it. And uh, I suppose I should have known better, um, but the doctors who, who saw me most definitely should have known better. And so what happened was there was this 
cascade of the pressure sores just not healing and then eventually getting worse. Um, I was trying to get more urgent medical attention and doctors were saying, oh, don't worry, it'll get better by itself. And of course, it continued to get worse by itself. Um, and when I was finally able to get back into the um, doctor's office, and this was after calling basically daily, and it was one of those crazy things that the one doctor I was seeing, he was on vacation for the week. He didn't have a backup. Another doctor I was seeing was not a plastic surgeon specialist. And so they were saying, well, I should really go to the other one and wait for them. And of course, all of this waiting made it get worse and worse. And by the time I got, I was seen back by, uh, uh, by the doctor who was the specialist, it was a stage four pressure ulcer with infection and, and it was too late. And so I had to be hospitalized right away. So I was hospitalized in early March of 2010, and that total hospitalization, uh, well, lasted uh, 10 or 11 weeks. Um, so I had to have what's called flap surgery. Um, flap surgery, if you imagine, say, a circular apple pie, and you cut out a small slice of it, and then you stretch the, the crust and the remaining apple underneath, to fill up that gap and you sew it back up together. That's basically what flap surgery is. So you do the same thing. In my case, it was on the, um, the ischial, on the, uh, the buttock area. But I estimate that my 10-week um, hospitalization, including the flap surgery, was probably in the area of $100,000. I know that um, pressure sores and stage four flap surgery, the average costs are in the range of Sixty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars per flap surgery to Medicare. So we've gone from a few thousand of prevention at the most up to the tens or even a hundred thousand um, dollars, and that's not rocket science to figure out which is better value. Unfortunately, that was not the end. I was discharged finally from hospital in um, May of two thousand and ten. Um, but then, because I was, I was still working the whole time, trying to get my seating corrected, um, and there were problems yet again. And so back in January of this year, January 2011, I was back again with stage two pressure ulcers. This time I did know better, um, and I essentially instructed the medical staff, this was here locally, I instructed the medical staff that uh, I had to be taken off the wheelchair, put on an air mattress, and kept on an air mattress until the stage two had healed over, until the skin had uh, become intact again. Uh, so I stayed in the hospital for uh, a bit over a week and then rented the same air mattress um, that I had in the hospital for my hospital bed here at home. Um, I stayed on it um, in bed for the best part of a month um, until the, the wound was, was completely healed. You know, the funny thing about a pressure sore, you're not sick, um, but you've got to be in a situation where, where the pressure is being relieved. Um, so I still want to go up and do things. Um, and when it was possible, um, I was able to be back in the wheelchair when I was in the, in the hospital. Unfortunately, and this is a situation I've found, um, I've now got moderate experience of quite a few hospitals up and down the Northeast Corridor. Um, and with very few exceptions, um, they just don't have the transfer knowledge and technology as they really should do. So um, I was in the hospital, I was in my wheelchair for part of the day, and then indicated to the nurse that I wanted to go back um, into the bed. And for whatever reason, they did not have a lift available. I know for a fact that they have some in the hospital. Maybe they thought it was um, too much work or it was in a different wing or whatever. Um, but they decided to transfer me uh, manually um, by lifting. Um, now, some people have different attitudes to this. I don't mind too much being lifted. I don't find it degrading or anything. 
Um, I know some people do. Um, but as a safety thing, um, it, it certainly is an issue. Um, on staff at the time was the, um, was the nurse, and so she summoned two aides, um, CNAs, um, and it was very clear from the body language of the CNAs that they did not want to lift me. Now, I'm not a very heavy person. I was uh, 150 pounds. Uh, in fact, I'd been losing weight as a result of the, um, um, of the pressure sore. And I was down to 135 when I went into hospital. So I'm not heavy, uh, but it was clearly they, they didn't want to be lifting me. Uh, so the three of them lifted me out of the wheelchair, and instead of doing a smooth transfer laterally over to the bed and lowering me down, I was pretty much literally thrown like a sack of potatoes um, onto the bed. Um, and this was with a stage four pressure ulcer. So, you know, a stage four ulcer is pretty painful, um, at least if it, if it has pressure on it. So my full weight was landing on this. Um, that was not a happy moment. Um, I would like to take um, young doctors in medical school and try and get them to be a disabled patient for 24 hours and understand what it's like when you can't push the call bell or you can't adjust the hospital bed or you have that transfer from hell um, or things like that, that none of which is rocket science, you know? On the scale of medical interventions, the technology is not quite Stone Age, but it's not very high advanced technology. Um, it's, it's more... Um, having the uh, those sensibilities and uh, um, and and there has to be some awareness and this has to you know come down from on high from people who um, who design medical school curricula. You know I've been in situations in um, hospitals where the call bell was out of reach and that wasn't an issue. Anybody who's got some reasonable dexterity or movement of their limbs um, could, could reach and find the call bell. I couldn't. So a CNA has to think, can the person actually reach the call bell? Um, which for me is essential because on every hospital bed that I've used in a hospital, um, if you've got a disability, you can't actually adjust the hospital bed yourself. Um, all of the buttons to do that are, um, are on either side, and, and I just couldn't... Um, uh, couldn't reach them. So you need the call bell for everything. Uh, basic things such as washing and, and brushing your teeth and feeding. Um, I can barely feed myself if I'm sitting up with things in the right place and everything. Uh, if I'm lying in a hospital bed, I can't feed myself at all. Uh, and people, at least, I mean, you know, I've encountered many people now in the medical profession again, across all, all levels of uh, um, training and occupation. And I would say there are very few of them who really uh, have a good feel of, of just exactly what it's like. You know, I'm not, I'm trying, I'm not whining about it. Um, I'm just saying that uh, if people whose professional job it is to do these things have just a little bit more experience and knowledge and understanding and thought, um, then, then everybody's life would be a lot easier. It was just before I was hospitalized at the um, um, doctor who examined me and then uh, sent me to hospital. Again, in his doctor's office, he had an examination table, uh, but no transfer equipment. Um, he worked single-handedly. Actually, the first time I saw him, um, he got his secretary to help transfer me. Um, generally, secretaries don't like having to lift people. It's not their job, and uh, they shouldn't be doing that, and they're certainly not trained to do it. Um, so I guess the next time he figured he wouldn't ask the secretary, but did it himself. Uh, now, he was quite a strong guy and was able to raise the examining table up to the same height as my wheelchair. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult for one person to do that. Um, and again, I had a stage four um, pressure sore. And so some of the process meant dragging me laterally 
which was then applying shear um, on the saw. And if anything, shear is more painful <coughs> than, than direct pressure. Um, so that's how I was transferred onto the examining table. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's very common that uh, I've never, I don't think I've been to any single doctor's office where they've actually had transfer equipment. I see medical staff very, very regularly. Um, either nurses who come to my house, I have frequent visits to a doctor's office, neurologist, physiatrist, urologist, uh, you name it, uh, primary care, you name it. Um, I see quite a few doctors, and not one of them has a way of weighing me. If I were weighed every time I went, I could at least be monitoring things. The last time I was weighed in a doctor's office, was when I could last stand on my own two feet, which was well over 10 years ago. Understanding these things really should be a basic part of medical training, um, not just for doctors, but, but anybody involved, uh, um, PT, OT, nursing, um, CNAs, the whole, uh, the whole thing. I've got a very, very simple choice in front of me that I can either sort of sit back and let things happen and usually they either won't happen or the wrong thing will happen or I can take charge and uh, that's what I choose to do. I feel that I'm able to speak and so I feel I have a responsibility to speak. Healthcare Stories Made possible with generous support from the Manuel D. and Rhoda Mayerson Foundation. Michael Logg was interviewed in his home in Princeton Junction, New Jersey, July 2011. For more information, visit the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund website, dreadf.org forward slash healthcare dash stories. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported license.